and cracking jokes work? It works when you have to hold back. I think a lot of work, you know, giving uh, a lot and holding okay. back. Yeah, I got a true uh, story for you. So many, 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 many moons ago. Hold on, wait was, for the story. Let me record this you record on the, the computer story? because otherwise the people watching. They'll forget about the story. Yeah. So I have a story. So there's a time. The end. <laughs> yeah. The end. I needed a Kung Fu lesson. So I had to go to Sifu Fu. One of my lessons why. was at like 5.30 in the morning. And then I had another lesson in the afternoon and during the week. Well, one morning on my way into class, I must have got up at 4.30 in the morning and I got to class on time. It was about 5.30 and I walk in and this guy, he's standing on a post, right? And he's just swinging. He goes, look, I'm a pendulum. And I went, oh man, I got to go move sheetrock today. I just want to be a pendulum. So that's why I wanted to teach martial arts because I wanted to swing and call myself a pendulum. How's that working for you? He's still beating me up. <laughs> I'm saying, have you got to the pendulum swinging? Not aspect? quite yet. I'm working on it. When we get a couple more members in Enter Shaolin, I maybe can become a pendulum. <gasps> oh, that's awesome. My plan. All right. Well, welcome everyone to our webinar. We want you. Yeah, we're on YouTube, but you say hi to everyone. Hi. This is Sifu Larry. We got Sifu. I'm TJ Jamie Flies and we're in a Shaolin. And he's going to go help everyone out on YouTube and Facebook. If you have any questions, make sure to put it below the video. Um, Sifu Larry will either address it or make sure it gets sent over to us if it's something more complicated that needs demonstration. Right. And Jamie's all ready to get some, take some hits, take some hits. She's ready. And he's ready too. No. So. Whichever you prefer, you can oh, put it put, it put in your comment if you want Jamie to get beat up or Sifu Larry. Either one's fine. All right. So, <laughs> or would you have CJ Jamie beat up Sifu Larry or oh, vice versa? <laughs> there you go. I like that one. All right. <laughs> so, or vice versa. Well, I don't like the other part, but he does beat me up, so it is what it is. Um, that's how that's how you train. So for all of you that are going to our seminar next week, I can't believe it's already going to be next week. Um, that's insane. It's so close. We are super excited to see you all. And for those of you that... Yeah, you me too. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm all right. I'm super excited to see you all. Maybe see who Larry is and him not so much. No. <laughs> but um, we are super excited to, to get to meet uh, some new faces and see some of our old family members that have been going to our uh, mini seminars we've been doing in Pittsburgh. And uh, we will have information out about our next seminar uh, sometime within the next week or so. So those of you that could not make it to the Washington DC event, not a problem. Um, if some of you are late to the game and are like, yo, I wanna go to that seminar, I did reserve a couple extra rooms, three to be exact. And so if you want to come still, there is availability to get the discounted rate. Um, just email me at support at and I will get you all the details and get you registered and hooked up. All right. So yes, Karthik, it is exciting. Karthik's going to be there. So we are super excited about that. If you have questions and you are in Zoom with us for the live webinar, just make sure you put it in the Q&A section. Um, if you want to talk to all the panelists, just, which is just us specifically, just do all panelists in the chat. If you want it to go to everyone when you're in the chat, make sure you do all panelists and all attendees. And we'll do our best to man the chat room as well on here while we get to everyone's questions. I know we have a lot of questions uh, and email. We'll get to those in a moment because Dominic has sent us over a question. He says, can you talk about rooting in the cat stance? I'm easily knocked over with all weight on the back leg when being pushed from the front. How would you deal with a push from the front in a cat stance? Okay. Um, naturally, it is your instinct to go to a bow and arrow. You should not stay in a cat stance unless you're very good at controlling the energy in your hands. The reason why you're getting pushed backwards easily is not because of the root. It's your lack of control. So uh, if you're trying not to control them, basically just withstanding the force, you need to be in a bow and arrow. So if you're trying to get, let's say, somebody's pushing me and I'm a cat, and, it, and I get pushed, it's because my hands don't know how to deal with it. Uh, naturally, if you want to withstand the pressure, not necessarily controlling the pressure, she's pushing me, I wouldn't want to go to a bow and arrow. That gives me a stronger stance. It roots my rear leg down to the ground, allowing me to drive more forward energy. Now, the cat stance works, but what you lack in your stance to hold structure, you must make up in skill somehow. So if I'm in a cat stance and she's pushing me, you have this microphone so they can see your legs better. And they have to deal with the energy then. So if I'm in a cat stance like this. Okay, sorry, our microphone is like wigging out when we moved it. So hopefully you guys can hear us again. Thumbs up. So if I'm in a cat stance, I have to compensate the lack of structure in my feet by using my hands. So she's pushing me. 
I have to learn how to take the hands and learn how to use the hands to direct the force because you have to deal with the energy. If there's force coming at you, you have to redirect it or you can withstand it. If you take a bone out, it gives you the chance to withstand the pressure, but still you, you still want to use your hands to control. Otherwise, if you put too much pressure, you can be pulled. So you don't want to do something where you're going against the force. The goal is you have to learn how to control the pressure within your arms. Just remember, in the end, when we connect, our hands connect to the opponent most of the time and our feet, oh, I'm, I'm talking about standing, not on the ground, uh, but your feet are designed to connect to the ground and your hands are designed to connect to the opponent. So the idea is get the energy from the ground to control the opponent through the arms. So you really, the, the, the lack of failure for most people is in the arm control. Even if you take a bow and arrow stance, if your arm control is not well, you could be pulled and you can still be pushed. It just allows you to take a higher stress level, a higher pressure, a lot of pressure more. Uh, but in a bone like, than a cat, but still, if your arm's not there, you're still going to fail. Okay. In the end, you have to learn how to deal with your arms because that's what they're pushing you. They're pushing you through their arms and their body. They're using the legs to drive it up their body into their hands and they're trying to take you backwards through that. If they're using their hands and, and trying to push and fight and combat for your hands, you have to deal with the hands that way. So it's very important that your hands learn how to control it. The stances don't really matter in terms of whether you're in a cat, a horse, or a bow. What matters is learning how to compensate the energy pressure between the hands to the feet. That's the more important. Dominic said that was what he suspected and perfect. Thank you. Bob Welcome. says, Jamie, beat up Sifu. Do you mean Sifu Larry or Sifu Fu? Sifu Larry, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see what we else have here. If there's any other comments that we can go to. A lot of good mornings. Good morning to everyone or good evening, depending on where at in the world you are. And I just want to give a quick shout out to everyone that is on the live webinar with us. We have Alvin, Billy, Bob, Brian, Kegler, Caleb, Catherine, Dan, Dominic, Ate, John, Karthik, Moshe, Shabbat Shalom, Moshe, Neil, Nick, Richard, Russell, Sifu, Larry, of course, manning the other side, and Terry Hall. So welcome everyone. We got lots of you on. I think this is the most we've had on zoom with us so we between that and youtube we should have lots and lots of questions today so super excited about that and while you guys and gals are waiting uh to think of some questions i'm going to go ahead and get to our webinar questions that we got sent in in the past several days Let's see i think we got everyone caught up from last week so we're good with that all right so Vivek says, hi, Master Fu. No, please show how to remove tiredness when sparring. So how to not be tired and uh, wear yourself out, how to keep that It, it, it comes down to two things, okay? Conditioning and then a matter of conserving your energy in motion. Are you fighting in the pressure or you learn how to move for the pressure? Obviously, you'll get more tired if you go against the pressure. So learning how to control the energy, working with the energy, that's going to help you with conditioning to last longer and also obviously the higher potential for conditioning the longer you'll last. Um, most common thing is when, when you're throwing a punch, uh, recovery time is very important. So for example, if I'm punching and I'm going like this, uh, it takes more energy because my body's going forward versus like this and, and rooting, knowing how to recover by not letting the energy escape and trying to bring that back to you. The idea is any energy goes out if it's not connected to the person, then you have to sink into the ground to get your root to be stronger and use that ground to bring your energy back or continue to go forward. Uh, a lot of push-pull type of motion, that's what's going to tie you out. A lot of uh, extension, overexertion or uh, tie you out. Obviously, getting hit is going to tie you out because you're, you're using your energy to withstand pressure. So knowing how to move with pressure, that's, that's really going to help conserve you. Like I said, when you break it down, it comes down to two things, conditioning and then your, your expenditure of energy, the cost. Every strike costs energy, every block costs energy, every hit costs energy, and getting hit costs energy. Everything you do that moves costs energy. The whole idea is to maximize your um, output with minimal uh, input. So the idea is learn how to make yourself more efficient, learn how to strike using your root rather than your weight, learn how to hit more focused than it is more forceful. Those things makes the difference. If you're talking about in terms of grappling, you know, when you're on the ground, rest, put dead weight rather than and put your force into the ground, push against the opponent, just rest on the opponent, put one point of control like my ribs and my body and have that weight on them. So the idea is to put pressure on them. Don't let pre pressure get put on you. Anytime you put having pressure on you, then it's going to cost you more if they're much stronger. It's going to wind up 
expelling your energy because you're trying to fight them. The idea is to convert energy, not fight energy. The goal is to rest on point and not go past point. Uh, watch that you're not taking energy and going, uh, for example, if I'm pairing someone, I don't go like it, let it drop. That you can see it's going to my elbow versus like this and drawing my wrist and it stays up in my hands more. So those are the things that makes the difference, you know. Um, any little bit, every time you move, it's going to cost. And it might not be much of a difference, but when you add up, you know, 20 strikes, 30 strikes, they start to make a difference. So all those things, efficiency, economy of motion, that's what you want to study. That's what you want to practice. And that's what you want to use. Absolutely. And uh, another thing is make sure that you're breathing properly. If you're losing your breath, you are going to lose energy. Yes. If you're holding your breath, that's another thing. Good point. I should have said that too. But you know, <laughs> uh, 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 that, that stresses the body. Oh, hmm, huh, huh. That, that's more, less pressure on the body, but it can still generate high pressure because you're supposed to burst the pressure and not stay on pressure for a long time. Right. If you feel like your heartbeat is going really, really fast and you're losing your breath, then you need to work on learning to control your breath while you're practicing. So practice, efficiency, emotion, control your breath. Bam. Dominic says, good luck creating either if they don't want you to. Well, I don't know about Sifu Fu. I'd probably have to do like an element of surprise to get him, but I have gotten Sifu Larry a few times. You can ask him about it. I can take a lot of punishment. <laughs> he said I suckered him. Maybe. I don't know, but I got him. So <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get to some other questions. Um, Nick says, uh, sorry about that. What's the most effective way to increase? Oh, okay. peripheral vision. Peripheral vision. Sorry, I didn't know what he was saying sorry about. And then I saw the other question. I was like, why is he sorry? Okay, so he, he sent over a partial question. So how? what's the most effective way to increase peripheral vision? Uh, practice. What I want you to do is like imagine like you've got your keys on the table. Don't look at it. Learn to look to the side of it and look here and pick up whatever. Uh, I, I do a practice all the time. One of the biggest things, like a lot of students who start with me, they always think I'm not paying attention to them because I look away. And, I, and it's just a habit now that I do it. We've actually and had like, people complain about that on YouTube when we're doing different drills and we're not looking at each other like, oh, you guys are so disrespectful. We're really just training properly. We, I, it just, it's just something that I do all the time. Uh, I look off because I, I allow my peripherals to see them. So I, especially when you're teaching like, you know, a group class and you got like 10 people, 20 people in the class, mm. I'm focused on one and I'll teach somebody and I can see someone out of the corner of my eye and I can say, don't do that. And like, how, how do you know that if you're not looking at me? Because I can see, you know, uh, Asians have the advantage because their eyes are slanted so they can see wider <laughs> view. So I, I, I try to use that to my advantage. Yeah, really big so, eyes. So, I can see. so she's more narrow. No, uh, I can see all over the place. Uh -uh. <laughs> but you you want to practice a lot. Like uh, like I said, if I practice, if I'm looking at here, I can see Jane. I can go. Mm -hmm. I, I can see off my peripheral. So one of the things you want to just practice, practice is just learn to pick up things. You know, okay, if you have to look at them at first, that's fine because you you have that uh, natural instinct to do that. So we got to train you to just look. Now look away and then see your peripheral and pick up the keys. Uh, again, I practice all the time when I teach. Sometimes when I talk to people, I don't even look in the eyes. I, like, I, I find sometimes people think I can be rude. It's not being rude. It's just a force of habit I do. Just I look away. I never look straight. Um, I always see through my peripherals. I can see here right now my hands, mm -hmm. and I'm not having to look. I, I can just see my hands just from the training. Remember, peripheral vision is not specific. It's just for generals. In other words, like I couldn't read a book out here, right, but I can right. see motion. Like we were and objects. At, at my school one time when it was a bunch of our students, we were watching a movie, had a TV in there, and it was dark. And the spider came up floor, barely in the light, but it's watching. But I picked it up out of the corner stuff, of my yeah. eye, just very on the floor. Even though everyone's watching the screen, I actually saw the spider. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. and I actually grabbed a napkin and released him. But nobody saw it because they're looking straight in the TV. Although I looked straight, my peripherals could still see everything. And so I saw this movement just out of the corner of my eye. And then I looked into it and I was like, oh, that's a spider, you know, but your peripheral is designed to pick up motion. And that's mm -hmm. what you want. You're not looking to read the letter. You know, it's not designed for that. It's designed to pick up intent and, and motion around you so you can be aware of your environment better. And yeah. so you don't get caught up in staring because that causes delight. Yeah. Also, um, for me personally, um, if I am really like staring at my uh, training partner, I find that I flinch more too. So by looking peripheral, yes. you flinch less and, and respond better. So instead of just reacting to it, um, but just, yeah, like Sifu Fu said, just practice doing it. Like you could even be doing it sitting at your desk, uh, wherever you are, you can practice it. If you're out in public, you can see like, you know, figure out how many people you can actually see moving 
to the side of you without actually looking at them. Like, oh, that person's wearing this and that person's wearing that. And oh, there's a sign over there or there's a store here. Like there's just ways you can just practice it all the time. And, and this is why moms also, they people say they have, you know, eyes in the back of their head. It's because we're really good at using our peripheral. That's how we know what's going on. Just a tip for you. If you're wondering how your mom had eyes in the back of her head. It's just her peripheral. That's all. <laughs> There's really not eyes back there, I don't think. So, <laughs> all right, Neil says, is there a video on footwork, which is very important in structure and like you just said, rooting? Yeah, we have videos on that. It's on our site. Um, but just remember this, when it comes to footwork, really the more important thing is your core. You naturally, your feet naturally find center. Yeah. Okay. And what I mean by that is if you were to stand on one leg and I just pushed you, your feet will naturally find a place to put down to stabilize you. It's natural. If your core is off, I push and your body went like this, then, then you're going to stumble when you go backwards because your core is off. The more important thing is making sure your core is in contact, making sure the core is your stomach and your shoulders connected to that. And that's, that's maintaining your core. Rooting is getting your, your, your body connected to the ground. And sinking is just the way of enhancing that root. But sinking doesn't give you root. So you have to be very mindful that your core is strong, your body's in position to maintain that that root. And just bending your knees and turning hips in the ground, that's only that's sinking, like I said, but that doesn't give you root. That only enhances it if you have it. So make sure that that's there. Um, in terms of structure, like I said, we talked about the core. That's your, that's your structure and your, the nature, how you move your arms. That's that's very important because that's going to give you the ability to withstand pressure and then your wrist is ability to control the pressure. All those things are how your body breaks down to handle pressure. Uh, again, footwork is not that important compared to the core. If the core is bad, the footwork is going to be bad. Yeah. If the core is good, your footwork will be good. So you got to watch for that. And that's, that's really the key. And, and Neil, I don't know if you're practicing Tai Chi, but Tai Chi actually helps with all that stuff that Sifu was talking about. Um, Qigong also helps a little bit with that too. And there's some footwork stuff in the Wing Chun area as well as the Nodak Na section. And there's a lot of core training, obviously in the core training section too. So happy training. All right, Dominic says, I visited a Wing Chun school last night and they preferred a stance which is 50-50 with both feet and hips forward, but I felt the strain on my ankle, just like you said in your bow and arrow stance video. What are your thoughts on a 50-50 weight stance? Okay, first, it's fine. Um, in combat, you're never going to stay in one stance. You're never going to fight 50-50. You're going to go to a bow and arrow cat stance, horse stance. You're going to go through all that. So all are important to stay on one in combat is not, not ineffective. Uh, because it, it's really once a guy puts pressure on you, you need to know how to sit back or step back or step to the angle or go forward. You need to have all that. Um, so stances are very important. The three fundamentals of the cat, the, ho the horse, the 50-50, and then the bow and arrow. You need to know how to transition between them based on the feel and your experience. Uh, you cannot stay on one, okay? If you're locked into one, you're going to be in big trouble. So you, you cannot stay on one. It's like learning one parry every, for every punch. It's like, no, it, it's not enough just to stay. You know, we have a, a hand, a, a, the Wu hand, we call it the default hand, but it's not the only hand. It's just the default, but you got to go from there and turn to something if the need should call for it. So it, it, it's, it's the same thing. 50-50 stance is fine if you want to start off, but like if someone's pressing you, you might want to sit back and turn that into a bow and arrow to reverse it or step forward to a bow and arrow to drive in, if they, especially if they're doing big long like superman punches and you can see it come you can shift to a bone out and go in but go to 50 50 50 50 like that you're, you're stuck you're stagnant that's why it's no good because you become robotic and you you need to have the ability to change you need to shift to close in uh, uh shift to go back uh get in the horse stance to drive you to get a, a stronger sit into the root they are very very important so to say one's more important than the other and stay in one over the other is no good it's no good at all um, he also says, I know you do the 70-30 in a bow and arrow, but I'm curious to know if you would modify the bow and arrow stance for a 50-50 distribution by perhaps turning the foot into a smaller than 45 degree angle. Uh, your stances are weight distribution. That's really what they are. So the turning of the foot is really going to depend on how you uh, attack or counterattack. But the weight distribution, weight distribution is is your cat, the 90-10, 100-0, or 70-30 in the bow and arrow and 50-50 on the horse. Uh, whether you turn your feet, that that's all going to depend on the combat situation. But in terms of uh, a 50-50, that's not a bow and arrow. Bow and arrow 70-30. So if you're saying, is there such a version of the 50-50 bow and arrow? No, there is not. If you're in a 50-50, it's a horse stance. It's a standard mid, mid stance. So there, uh, whether you turn your feet in, turn your feet out, that's all going to depend, like I said, the kind of attack, where the angle you want to go to or, or move into. Uh, so uh, there's no such thing as a 50-50 bow and arrow stance. That's just a horse stance. Dominic says, thank you. 
Kagler says, what do you think of non-contact Western boxing and savate? Savate. Savate. Yeah, that's French. Kick, Sorry, actually. never seen that before. Um, everything has its purpose. Everything has its value. To stay in one thing, like I said before, non-contact. Um, I don't know what they're doing, so I can't say. But if they're talking about not really hitting each other, then they're not feeling pressure and understanding if the technique is good or not. You need to have pressure. You have to have contact to test it. Now, I always tell people, you know, um, punch harder at me. You know, go harder. And I let them see. Like, it doesn't matter how hard you punch. I, I, I'll show you that it's, it's irrelevant. But if I never have contact, how am I going to tell if I ever do it right? I can guess I'm doing it right, but I can't tell until I have pressure. Same thing when we do all a lot of pressure tests and when I teach this to them. They, I, we always go through a lot of pressure tests. And what I mean by pressure tests is like I'm punching Jamie in the face and she leans in on me to pre and I'm collapsing on that. That tells me that I'm not connected right. And that that it, it's it, if she was a 280 pound person coming forward and had a lot of weight behind it, I probably would collapse on the punch. Whereas if I'm doing it like this and she comes at me, she comes at me, mm. she's not going to. And that shows that that impact is right, that my, that my, my focus is right. Okay. Non-contact can get you to help you in your reflex and maybe so you don't handle the pressure. So, oh, I mean, not, not handle, but you're not under pressure, but you need to be under pressure to show that you can handle it. And so you got to have people put pressure on you. It's, it's, that's great as one aspect, but it's not the only aspect. You right. can't train that. You want to train all around, just like today's MMA. It's great to do striking, but you can't just do striking because the grappling shoots in. If you don't know how to handle anti-grappling or counter-grappling or grappling itself, then you're going to be at a loss. You have to be well-rounded and you have to understand that you want to train in all aspects. Training for light sparring can help you in terms of like reading for reflex. Like if she's punching me, I might just want to be like this and I do like this and yeah, it helps. Fine. It's good. So, you, you know, there's a, a stage in which you're learning from. So if your technique's not bad, under a lot of pressure, you're probably your strength. So this might help you to just kind of like relax. Okay, she's punching me again. I'm doing this. So I'm practicing. I might go like this. So she can't give me any punch. So I can just go like I'm learning how to just get the readings like this. So uh, we're off camera Oops, now. But we're off camera, you're, you can see I'm just kind of <laughs> like just relax. But then when someone's really punching you, are you going to be the same way? That'll help build you up but you got to have that pressure so you can tell if you can so if she's punching me I, she's pushing into me and I, i'm not really good at i'm gonna clap so i need to know she's punching i need to know that i'm turning the point right i'm controlling the energy right so i need to have that you need to have hands-on training you have to have pressure on you and you know if the pressure is too much and you're breaking they gotta go lighter pressure yeah. because you have to learn to use the technique not your strength to compensate so remember what you lack in skill you make up in strength so if you find that using strength to do it then your technique is off Okay. The and technique didn't fail you. Less and pressure. Rest. So and you have the time workout. to learn how to do it. Yep. Okay. Um, Sifu, Larry sent over from Eddie. Sifu, how do you increase your force in a punch? Acceleration. So you have to train your tendons and technique and then your focus. Okay. That's how you get power. Okay. When you define it, it comes down to force over area. Area is your focus, to where are you hitting, and then your force. Okay. And obviously getting your technique, everything behind it, learn how to get your, basically, uh, if you want to try to get your force in terms of your, your timing, timing is very important because if your timing is off, I can punch with a lot of arm power of my hips behind, I can impact and then get the leg <clears throat> and that'll create Im improper timing and then it'll fail you. So timing is very important with the technique and the focus. All, all those three are, are very, very important. So getting your connection and the connection is basically, if you break it down, it comes with six points in your body, your ankle, your knee, your hip, your shoulder, your elbow, your wrist, and then combining all that to work and snap all at one time and getting to the point in which you're making contact to a small point, you develop very, very, very good power and, and, and very little effort. Cause you know, picking up a dumbbell with just a bicep puts a lot of stress on the bicep. Let's just say it would take 50 kilojoules to pick up from your bicep. But if you divide the workload among your whole body, it's still the same energy. It's just, it might be, let's say I, I have a, uh, 10 points in my body. So it's only five kilojoules per muscle group because I'm using more muscle group, but it's still the same energy. It's just less work per muscle group, less load per muscle group, I should say. And that'll help you. So dividing the workload is much better. It's less strain on the body. And Eddie, I don't know if you remember, but we have tons of videos on how to focus on your punch and get it better and all the different techniques that Sifufu is talking about. Mm -hmm. You can check it out, entershellen.com forward slash join. Zoof says, is there a difference between rooting and balance seeing one center of gravity? I've seen other martial arts such as karate or Wing Chun emphasize on maintaining one center of gravity and not sure if that's one and the same as rooting. It's synonymous. It's like wet and water. It's synonymous. Uh, finding a center of gravity, like rooting is not necessary. Um, 
always being centered because rooting could be at a bow and arrow. So I'm not centered in terms of my weight distribution. I'm centered in terms of my rooting to the ground. So depending on how you want to look at what you're saying in terms of uh, center, you're talking about uh, center of gravity, your, your balance in terms of standing one leg, because that's that's putting all in one point. Standing bow and arrow, you're not putting one point, you put in between two points. So um, that center of gravity is no longer divided on one point. It's divided between your front leg and your rear leg. Whereas if you're standing center of gravity on one leg, it's all on one thing. So if I'm getting my center of gravity, I am learning how to root because if I didn't have my root, I, I, I lose my balance. So, uh, but finding your root doesn't mean you have to have a, a center a, a, a point in your uh, leg. It's, it's divided among the legs. So that it, it's, it is slightly different, but they all work in the same because Rooting is a good center of gravity. That's if you have it, you have a good center of gravity. You have center of gravity. Um, it means you're balanced, but it's not necessarily like you're on one leg. It could be divided. So, uh, and then if you look like, well, you're rooted then. Yes, yes. That's like that. Water and wet, it's the same. Fire and hot, it's the same. It's synonymous. It's, it, it, it's, it, one gives off the other, but one is not the other. You, you know what I mean? So rooting gives you good balance, but balance is like because of a good root. The, and it's not you get a good root because you have balance. Yeah, well, I've, 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 getting a root maintains your balance, but getting a good balance does not necessarily mean that you have a good root. Because if I'm balanced on one leg, boom, I could get knocked over. Rooting means I could stay on the ground even in shifting, whereas balance is, is most, more stationary. You, you understand? So that's really the main difference. Awesome. Billy says, as a beginner in Wing Chun who can only train solo for the foreseeable future, can I do any of the rice trainer exercises with the wooden dummy? The reason I ask is I can only afford one training device and I can get a cheap freestanding wooden dummy delivered in two days where it'll take three weeks to get a rice trainer and I can't install a rice trainer on the wall of my apartment. Uh, you could do some things. You can't do all things. The difference between having the rice trainer and the jong is the rice trainer can move the arm. Yeah. And so... Lucy, watch. This can hit you if you mess up. So and so that that's different. movable. Um, you just have to modify some stuff. For example, like if I'm doing a hook around the arm, I can make the arm move. And the jong, you can't. You'd have to literally go around the jong. Yeah. So, it, it, but you'd have to modify. But most parts you can do. Most of them you can do. Yep. And um, Billy, I know like right now you don't have the funds for it, but um, in the future, if you do want to get something like that. Um, if you go to innerstyleland.com forward slash recommended and you go to where they sell um, the, the, the wooden dummies and all that stuff there, um, they also have them, these particular models, like on a freestanding thing. So that might be an option for the future if you want to have something like that. Um, or there's the Bob um, and there's a, something else that uh, one of our members sent me that's using um, the original Bob that some of you might actually have, where there's a jacket you can put on and add arms. That might be something that might help as well. So I'll see if I can find that email and I'll send that out in the Friday update to everyone too. Seafood Larry sent over from Wes Ross. What do you think of jujitsu? Jiu-Jitsu is good. It has its value. I mean, it's proven itself uh, in, in, in MMA. Uh, it's proven itself. In, if you watch videos, Jiu-Jitsu has shown that it can take a lot. But in it by itself, it, it becomes weak because, as you can see, in MMA, it's, it's, it's grown. It's uh, evolved to where it can handle grapplers. You know, you can see a lot of times these strikers will learn how in the beginning they didn't. But now you got the ground and pound techniques. You got people knowing how to handle um the grapplers so you know now the grapplers need to evolve and know how to handle the strikes too because everything's evolving it changes everything's changing and so you have to adapt to that change now history you'll always see things change you always see people like karate was so powerful you know and then came aikido you know aikido Jiu Jitsu, and they learned how to take shotokan take their energy absorb it and turn it back to them everything has to evolve even bruce lee evolved his style because he saw that in china it worked well because people like to fight close in America, he saw that people did not like to stay close. They liked to make their space. He, that's why he started thinking outside the box and said, listen, this doesn't work here. And he started evolving it and ch trying to make like he did. A, a, he wrote a book. I didn't read it. I saw it. But he did like low kicks and learn how to close in the distance by taking out the legs first and then closing the distance and then using your wood chun for that ability. So no matter what style you do, you have to find a way to handle whatever it is you're fine. That's why we're all about the energy. Cause then, you know, no matter what style you are, it's about the energy, learn how to control the energy. We'll adapt to anything. It's universal. So uh, if I'm in a grappling situation, I, I, I tell my students this, you know, in the beginning, if you ever looked 
uh, people, when the jujitsu came, a lot of people did sprawling techniques. They wanted to get away and they actually uh, was trying to prevent that from happening. Now you see more people, they know how to get in and close in and come down on top of them and, and try to put pressure back on. So they have learned how to um, handle takedowns and put that back on them. Whereas before people wanted to prevent it. Now people don't mind getting into it and learn how to put on and it's evolved. So jujitsu itself should evolve. If it's all about pure grappling, you're doing for sport. It's great. But if you're doing an MMA, obviously nobody just does pure jujitsu because they're going to get hit in the face is you know, easy. They don't know how to handle how to the, handle the strikers as well. So they have to evolve if they're trying to, uh, to uh, uh, become more improved upon handling these MMA guys. And, you know, that's what martial arts is always about evolving. Once you start sticking to one thing and times change and you don't, you're an old record. You know, you're an A track. If anybody knows what that is, it's, it's out of date. You need to update today. Everyone streams, you know, so you got to update with the times people are going to handle differently. And you got to learn how to handle that. The good thing is energy is universal. It's always there. It stays true from the beginning of time to the end of time. It's always going to be the same. You know what, what today is like the principle of energy. It's the it once to go the path of resistance, right? That's going to stay for the next hundred years. Can, can I prove that? Well, I can tell you, no one can disprove it. So, um, it's, it's, uh, these are science, these are facts, you know, learning how to understand principles and using that to adapt to techniques. That's what you want. Awesome. Awesome. So Billy says, thank you, Sifu Fu and CJ Jamie for your reply. I will look into the free standing version of the rice trainer. Awesome. Uh, Nick says, dumb question. There's no dumb questions. Is Nodak Ma more yin or yang? That's not a very smart question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, it, it's both. Yin and yang yeah. works together. It's mm -hmm. not one or the other. It's a balance of the other. And we adhere to that. We are talking about working both. Now, there's a time you need to be more yin. There's a time you need to be more yang. And that's the whole thing. It's always in a changing. It's always adaptable. And so that's what you want to always keep. You want to have both. One without the other. I learned, my teacher told me, if you're too much yang, you can overcommit. You can be pulled. You can be taken. If you don't have enough and you're too much yin, you'll collapse under pressure. Mm -hmm. You have to have both. You have to have yang behind your yin. You have to have yang behind your yang. Without it, you're out of luck. Absolutely. And that's why we have the yin and yang on here. Balance. You need both. So that was a good question because I'm sure there's other people wondering the same thing. So, um, if you don't understand what this is, I'll do a lecture on it. Or did I already? I think you I did. Think I did. You I did. did. I yeah. Did. So yeah. if you're a member, um, and Larry, where are the lectures at? In the Nodak Na section, there is a lecture on the yin and yang. So check that out if you haven't already. It's really good. All right. So let's see here. We have Donato says, hi, everyone, and hugs to the whole family. Hugs right back at you. He says, my question is, what's the proper way to develop and train sensitivity when not in touch range with the opponent? Uh, none. Sensitivity requires pressure. It requires contact. So there is no way to develop sensitivity without touching. What you can develop is technique, but not sensitivity. Sensitivity, you need to have contact. You need to feel intent. You need to feel uh, the pressure, when he's going to do it, where he's going, and how much he's going. That's what sensitivity is all about. It develops three things, when, where, and to what extent. So you need contact for that. Right on. Herbert says, a couple of questions. One, you mentioned it act now. 102 on the last webinar. Can you give more details on this? Um, I think you were talking about 101 and 102. Uh, 102 is not out yet, but Nodak Na 101 uh, covers obviously Nodak Na principles, um, core training, Chinna, as well as Qigong. I believe that is everything. There might be a little bit of Wing Chun that we get into at the very, very end of it, but most likely that will start in 102. Basically, it's a course that helps you understand all the different things that we teach at Enter Shaolin and walks you through a week by week basis of that training. Um, it's really great if you have no idea what you want to train or how you want to combine all the stuff that we're teaching you. Um, there's quizzes at the end of each week and you can also submit, I think it's every uh, three months, you're able to submit in a video to have critiqued as well. Um, you can learn all about that as well as any of our other membership options at entershellin.com forward slash join. If you're already a member, you already have access to it. It's in your my training section. Just go to the Nodak Now 101 and get started and enjoy. Um, two, are the legends true that Sifufu wears a weighted jacket because of his speed so the camera can actually keep up with him? I had no idea that this was a rumor or a legend. It's um, just a rumor. I don't. No. <laughs> but I do train my tenons a lot. I, I do a lot of tenon exercises. That's how you build up speed. 
It's not your muscles alone by itself. You need the tennis behind it because your tennis is your, your snapping point, and it's also where you control it through the wrist. So uh, you need to have that. Uh, uh, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm very fast is because, like I said, I train a lot on calisthenics. I do a lot of um, type of push-ups, uh, exertion. Core training section. Yes, I do a <laughs> lot of them. I do, I do a very, very, uh, like, a lot. <laughs> but uh, – the idea is also is to get your, your wrist control behind it because, you know, whatever your arms does, if the wrist is off point, then your whole arm follows it too. You know, like wherever the head goes, the body goes, wherever your wrist turns, that's where your arm's going to want to follow too. And so is your body going to go. So you have to practice making sure that you're, you're, you're getting the right focus with the right uh, snaps. Uh, we, like I said, I train to build density over thickness. So my muscles are very dense. Um, they're striated. You know, like a leopard's so for more speed. They're not bulky. Because remember, bigger muscles take is more mass. More mass means it takes more energy to move it. You know, a Mack truck versus a motorcycle. It takes more energy because it's more mass. So if you're built, trying to be bigger, I'm not saying it's bad. It's just you're going to have to dense those muscles up to allow for quicker speed yeah, you want and balance. hand motion. Yeah, there's a balance. Everything has a balance. There's a balance between everything that you do. There's, there's, it's good to have size, but it's not good when your size is not in control or your size is way too big that you're just one of these sluggers that are very like, big and, and you're, you're slow. Speed is very important. Accuracy is very important. And having that focus behind that. Having more weight can help. But remember, having too much weight can hurt. So there's a balance to everything. You got to train to make sure that that you, you want to have the right size in terms of body proportion. You know, a five foot two guy should not weigh 350 pounds. He's more round and wide than he is tall, and that's not good, okay? Uh, where body, or your body has a certain proportion. If you go to the doctor, say for this height, you should be around this weight based on your bone structure and your height. They could tell you what weight you should be. There's a certain proportion. You ever see people who are, are have the um, gigantism? Uh, uh, I don't know, it's not a disease, but genetic, where they grow up like seven foot something, it's actually not healthy for these people. These people have a hard time moving because the body's not really made to be that. Now, there's some cases, there are cases that people actually aren't affected by it. But, you know, for the most part, people who are bigger, it's hard for them to move. It's more mass, more energy it takes for them. Um, but there are a few people like that, that basketball player, the Chinese guy. They say for someone that tall, it's very unusual for him to actually be able to move and be coordinated right. and, and not be tired because, it's, 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 it's you know, more mass takes more energy. It's it just more, you know. People who are shorter can bench more weight normally than the guy who's much, much taller because he's got more range of motion. All these things go into play. So whatever your body type is, there's a certain proportion that you have to have. I don't know the exact proportion. I'm not a doctor, but I do know that. So you don't want to be like five foot 10, but you know, 385 pounds. You just become, like I said, too wide than you are and it becomes more heavy. There's a certain size that your bone structure is, there's a certain amount of mass that you should hold on that. If it becomes too, too big, uh, and people do that, you know, for bodybuilding, for, for steroids and stuff. And it looks good. It looks great. But, you know, it's very dangerous. You know, anybody going to the world bodybuilding, you, you, they can tell you it's very dangerous. You can, your organs can shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not very time. healthy for you. Although they look healthy, it's really not. You know, I don't know. Some of them don't look healthy to me, Sifu. Some of them look like they're about to have a heart attack. Well, yeah. But but Some I'm saying, them. you know, when the muscles look big, the veins come out. You know, one of the techniques is, is that they, they don't have carbs for like, I, I forget what they said. I had a student who was a barber, but they don't eat carbs for like, I think three days or four days. And they deprive themselves of any form of carbs. It makes the body shrink, shrink, shrink. And then they drink water just the day of competition, it bloats them up and makes them look bigger. That's why they look so veiny and not healthy. You could die. Your organs can actually shut down and die. It's not very healthy for you. It's a, it's a, it's a tough sport. Work with what God gave you. Natural is always best. That's my advice. All right, so um, I just think it's funny that there's legends about you wearing weighted jackets. I think that's so cool. Um, Herbert, I'd love to know where these legends came from because this is the first I've heard of this legend. So very interesting. But yeah, he's he's like right now he's just wearing a thin shirt. So he's, no weights, promise. <laughs> right. Maybe you're confused with the muscles behind it thinking it's a weighted shirt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Steve Larry sent over from Joseph. How can you train your default hands using the jong? Anytime you connect into the jong, just bring up to a woo and then turn it to whatever you need. So if I'm going to go to a ton, I want to get my hands. I don't know if you can see it, but if I'm, I'm going to make the, the, like the hand to a ton, I just want to go up here and lay it and be able to drive it. So anything I do, I, I make a woo, hook it in, I'm going to do a foop with it afterwards, and then learn how to turn. Anything I touch, I, I start off into the woo and then I'll change it into 
uh, anything I need to based on what you did. If I'm going to do a woo to a bill, you can see I can go from like, like, like here. I'll just go here, woo, and I'm going to turn my hand so, so you can see the hit and the turn. And then I can go into that. Now, that might be a little far. I don't know if you can see it, but that's you connect from the woo and then you turn to whatever you need you do uh, to do, whether it be a bill, a fluke, uh, a woo to a ton, a woo to a, a bong. Make the connection first. And the woo is so that your arms actually make the connection, not your hands. Your hands should not make the connection. If your hands make the connection, it's, it's actually bad for you. You don't want to make it from your hands. You actually going from the most the middle of the palm to the heel of the palm and then from there down on the pack. But apart from that, if you're doing like tons, fooks, bills, they don't take the hand. They actually take the arm first and then the wrist is able to turn into whatever. Dominic says, have you ever visited another Kung Fu school by invitation? Are you open to doing that sort of thing under the right conditions? Yes, I, I've done demonstrations for other uh, schools. I've, I've, I've gone for Kung Fu schools, karate schools. I've done for a lot. You know, I've, I've, I've done it for churches. I've done it for, I've, I've done a lot of seminars in my life. Um, I'm, I'm always open to going to, you know, if there's somebody wants to see what it is, I'm more than happy to demonstrate. But it's going to come at a cost where it's going to cost me a lot of money to get there. Obviously, I, they got to pay for that because I, that come out of my pocket because <laughs> it costs me right on right on so yeah absolutely we're fully open to sharing and we've done uh, seminars at other schools before um you know we go to pittsburgh every year mm -hmm. so you know and that's a place where um martial arts around the world gather together you know from all classification from karate to judo to jujitsu to all kinds so um they have kung fu guys there they have karate guys they have krav maga They've had all kinds of people come from all over the world and get together and uh, they, they share their knowledge and people learn. And I'm, I'm more than happy to, to show them um, what we're all about and, and, and help them become better as martial artists. Yep. So yeah, we will be in Pittsburgh. That'll be in November. I don't have the exact date. I think it is. Let me look at the calendar. 10th. It's Oh, it's going to be the 10th, 10th 11th, 11th, and 12th. 12th this year. So usually it's around 13th and 14th, but it's, it's usually Well, no, it depends on the month. Yeah, yeah. it changes. So. Yep, yep. So now it's uh, the 10th, 11th, and 12th. Always two weeks before uh, Thanksgiving. There you go. So uh, we will be going. Um, we are going to be sending out a survey, seeing how many people would like us to do a mini seminar on top of uh, the one hour teaching that seafood. And it'll be, be separate doing. from that one. Yeah, it'll be completely separate uh, from that. So I uh, will see how many people we can have interested in that. If we have enough people, then we'll do what we did uh, the last two years and do that as well. So that way you guys can get extra training. And if we um, don't have enough, we're not going to do it. So come. Right. It's a great time. <laughs> but if you just want to come and, and still hang out with us, we will be there. Um, and you will get to do here at least a, and be a participant in one hour of training. But obviously, who does want more than just one hour training? Come on. So um, I will send out a survey and we'll see how many people are ready to take advantage of that. It will be um, less expensive than our full seminar since it's, it's a half only, seminar. Yeah, so yes. that might be just the right budget for some of the other people that wanted to go to Washington, D.C., but it wasn't in their budget. So hopefully that will help um, some of y'all get out and get training with us. But it's in Pittsburgh. It's in Pittsburgh. Know. Yeah, Pittsburgh, PA. So um, I will send all the details in the Friday update to y'all. So. Let's see. Russell says, are there plans for a spr spring seminar? Um, yes, we have not figured out where yet. Um, I will be uh, sending out something probably after we figure out the Pittsburgh thing um, to find out different areas and, and find out like where the most interest is. And then uh, depending on that, we will plan a seminar from there. But yes, we will have a spring seminar. And I also have to get Sifufu's schedule for Israel for that year so I can figure out when we can fit that all in. So we will get to that. And, you know, um, we've talked about this and we're going to do a Tai Chi uh, seminar for those who want mm -hmm. to learn the no Tai Chi. It, it's very, very good for you. Um, one of the biggest things that that makes us stand out, I would say, is that we're not moving energy. We don't teach you how to move energy. We teach you how to control energy. And that's a big, big difference. OK. It's the difference, like learning how to just squeeze a trigger on a gun versus how to aim and squeeze the trigger. Yeah. Okay. It's, that's the difference. Uh, anyone can squeeze a trigger. Most people learn how to move energy, but not everybody knows to control energy. And that's one of the biggest, biggest difference. And that's what we teach in the no deck now system, the control, control, control. And that's the difference between succeeding and failure. It, it's that control. 
most people don't control. They either overcome or prevent or try to to, uh, to just get away. And that's wrong. You need to learn how to intercept that and control that. Otherwise, the pressure will always be on you unless you run away too far. You might get away from the first, but the second will come in and the third will come in, the fourth. And if you don't know how to put pressure back on point and back in the opponent, you're always going to play defensive. And defensive is not good, okay? The best defense is a good offense. You heard of that. And that's the goal. So, yeah, we're going to do Tai Chi. We're going to teach you how to feel energy. We're going to teach you how to control the energy. And we're going to teach you how to learn to break it down and teach it. So our, our Tai Chi seminar is going to be about giving you a certificate to teach the first third and then the second third and the third third. And yeah. to know, and, and and not just that, but it's beneficial for you as a martial artist. Good for your health. It's good for your body. It's good for you to control and, and adapt to what's around you because it's not just for your body. It's a mind thing too. So it's going to change the way I always like to say, you don't learn to react. You learn to respond. You don't learn to just move. You learn how to, to move in control. You know how to focus everything you do. You're in control. You start to sense what's around you. So things like if you put your cup on the desk and it falls, you'll just automatically pick it up. Um, one of my students is the Tai Chi been with me for many, many years, but he works in construction. And one time they had this big concrete thing hanging on a chain and actually fell and it came swinging at him. He said the Tai Chi saved him because he was actually out the corner. He was able to actually move, even though it hit him, he, it moved, he, mm. his body actually learned to conform with energy and he wasn't in the way. But as soon as he touched his arm, felt the pressure, he actually, he was able to actually turn his energy, move his body out of the way to avoid from being hit by that. He said that it hit him, it would have killed him. It was a big, big, like uh, one of those um, sewer concrete things, uh, the, the round things that you put in sewers. That thing fell off something and it swung, it was on a chain, it swung, it came that close, but he was able to hit on the side and he was able to move his body from that, put the energy into that force, the force was moving him, well, instead of letting it move him and take him, he actually allowed it to convert into his body and he actually was able to turn it from all the years of doing the Tai Chi and push hands and all that stuff. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, I, I've just noticed um, I already had pretty decent reflexes, I guess, for like the average person. But with my Kung Fu practice, your reflexes do get enhanced and Tai Chi just psh, makes it go through the roof. Um, and so I don't know if you guys caught, we are going to have not just certification for Nodak Na, but also certification for the Nodak Na Tai Chi, because those are kind of a little bit separate um, things. So some yes. people might just want to teach Tai Chi. Some might want to do Nodak Na. Some of you all might want to do all the above. So uh, what we will do is what our goal is next year is to have two Tai Chi seminars and two Nodak Na seminars to kind of split it up. And we'll probably do like every other seminar. So that way it'll work out. And um, that'll also probably work with Sifu Fu's schedule for Israel. And then as things go on and we have more time, maybe we can do three of each a year. We'll see how it goes and we'll just play it by ear, but we definitely want to be able to get out to all of you more, be able to touch hands with you, help you grow in you. your skill and meet yeah. you. So, so that's what our goal is for next year. We want to meet our families. Finding yes, out we yeah. had a cousin and we never got to know him. I want to know. <laughs> that's so cool. That is so cool. So Sifu uh, Larry says from West Ross, does bodybuilding work against your training or would it complement it? That depends. Uh, if you're bodybuilding to get big, it's going to work against it. Uh, yeah. Bruce Lee said this, and I like his quote, big muscles are only good for what it took to get them there. If you're using it and you got big muscle, it's because you're doing the lift weights. That's all it's good for. You need your tendons. You need to have forward energy to pull, pull up, not to push energy, but to hit into point. And lifting weights is not about hitting into point. It's about overcoming the force that's in front of you. So it's teaching you bad habits because it's teaching you how to overcome pressure, not to learn how to control pressure. Okay. But if you're bodybuilding to be more in terms of just like aerobic type of bodybuilding, when you're dense and you're fine, that's good. But when you're getting bulky, when it's out of proportion, again, your body's only made to be a certain proportion. So when you're, when your chest muscle is bigger than your head, it, it's not good. When you go like this and your bicep is much higher than your head, it's, it's out of proportion. It's, it's are not you like healthy. those guys that are really big up here, but everything down here is small. They look like they're about to fall over. That's not good. Yes. There has to be a balance. That other half and there needs to be a balance in two. <laughs> yeah. Um, Amit says, Hey, Jamie, see you. Hey, Amit. He says, I stopped the elevator once for a person at work. He said, cool reflexes to me. I hadn't noticed who it was. Then I noticed it was CEO of the company. Awesome. Um, let's see. Chris sent over from, uh, sorry, Christopher Lopez. He didn't send over anything. He said, Sifu, <laughs> and, uh, performing a bong style. I am directing my energy upward as a block or towards the person, as in the case of someone throwing a hook or haymaker. Okay, um, 
depends on what uh, if you're talking about a round punch it's it's always both okay you want to go up and forward that's most of our hands you go up and forward but two point you got to keep that in mind so if she's throwing like a round punch you're not doing this and going away you, you don't want that you want to punch me so you want to get it up and the reason why you want to up because we i talked about it before for every action is an obstacle reaction right so if you're pushing down what's the opposite of down up if you're pushing up what's the opposite up down so if you're taking motion where you're going to push one direction, if there's a lot of pressure, there's a feedback to you. Okay. They're always going to feel this feedback and it's going to always be the opposite to what you put in pressure. So if she's punching me, I'm pushing more this way. I'm going to feel it take me this way unless I can exert a balance. Okay. But you remember, you got to take in consideration their force. It's not just your force. It's their force. You have to learn to work. So if I'm pushing sideways, the opposite force, if I'm going this way, the opposite force is going to push me this way. So I have nothing to sustain me from falling. But we want to push up because what's the opposite of up? Down, right? As long as the earth is solid underneath my feet, I'm not going to sink and crash. I have, I, I'm, I'm going to use my legs to help create stability. And then that downward pressure I feel coming on me allows me to put more upward pressure and puts it back in the arm. And when I bring that upward pressure, I want to put it on point not to push away. A lot of times people are going too much for the motion. It's never about the motion. I always tell people to control the point and the motion goes behind it. Don't ever control the motion. What I mean by that is she's throwing a punch at me. I'm not trying to get her arms away. I just want to go into point. No, sure. okay. So I just here and I go in. I want to hit the point and I want to do like I, the, the technique, the follow through, I always call it, I call them ricochet techniques or skimming techniques depending on the application. I always want, she's punching me. I always want to hit and so I can move forward and in. I'm not moving until I can take the punch and get the punch away and deal with this because I'm exposed to my body. I don't need to worry about the punch if I control the point. Because once I hit the point, say she punches, just punch me. Push it in my face if you can. Just push it. No, turn your arm. Focus it. As, as she does, I, if I control the point, she's going to get the energy back and show it. Yeah. Force more. But if I'm like this, you see how she's going forward now? I didn't turn and control the point. I went for the motion. Oh, hold on. Come on. Do that little, little Jamie I'm going to do it to you. Come on. I'm going to knock you out. So when a person <laughs> throws a punch, I don't care. Okay. So if I go like this, do I look like I'm controlling the point or look like I'm pushing the arm? It looks like I'm pushing the arm. The goal is to control the point and stay on point. That when it does, see it stays there. So move, move, push it, force it. You can see I can control them now. Okay. So most people, they go for motion. And what I mean by that is like I always fake people out sometimes. Like I'm, I'm focused on my students. Uh, let's say he throws a hook punch too slow. Do I look like I'm going to point or look like I'm trying to push his arm away? You can see I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to go against his arm. The goal is hit point and just, boom, and then come to there. You can see anytime I hit the point, the next movement should feel like an attack. The flexion hands should always feel like they should be able to attack without resetting. If you have to reset to get the attack, you didn't have a good deflection hand. If he's punching me, I should go, and then be able to go right towards his face from that. So I, no matter how hard he punches, you can feel that it hits his arm and then hits his face. It shouldn't feel like. I'm stopping the arm and then trying to punch the face. By that time, he'll get another punch in. If he throws two punches, I mean, like this, I'm wasting my time trying to defend too much. He gives you two punches again, I already have that coming in. Every movement, he gives another punch. Every movement I do is designed to hit, to hit. There's no such thing as blocking. Block is a waste of time. It's defensive. It makes you try to get rid of the energy or receive the energy. I'm not trying to wait for the energy. I, I don't wait. I, don't, I tell my students, don't wait, initiate. Okay? Don't hesitate initiate and what i mean by that is he throws a punch this is waiting this is me waiting for it to come this is me initiating it's just a little bit he punches harder <laughs> it come back to him because i am answering questions again <laughs> i'm not blocking him i'm hitting him it looks subtle but it's there i don't need much i just need right it's like when he punches me if i had a pencil or a pickaxe an ice picker and i just turn that it's going to go right into him and he's going to move from that and that's the idea. You're not defending. You're not deflecting. Any type of parry you do should have an impact to hit, not an impact to push, to move away, or get rid of energy. It's designed to hurt it. It's designed to hit it. It's designed to, to go from there to the next shot. Uh, anything other than that, it becomes uh, questionable because what stops the guy from attacking you? It's only three things that allow a guy – Which there's only three things that will stop a person from attacking you, right? Knock him out, hurt him, damage him, lock him out, get to a point, break the joint, and make him submit for that, or they get what they want. So if you're not following your deflection based on those two, not three, 
two principles, either intercepting and locking them out or intercepting to hurt them, it's a waste of time. That's why deflections don't work because you're waiting for the next punch to come and you did nothing to attack. If you're defensive, then you're allowing the guy to be offensive. You have to be counter-offensive or offensive. Any other way, you're allowing the guy to attack you and, and there's nothing that stops him because you didn't lock him out or you didn't knock him out. All you do is let him get what he wants and that's not what you want. Unless you don't mind getting beat up or getting robbed. And, and that's, I always like to say, don't get me wrong. If someone wants your money, give them the money. It's not worth fighting and risking your life, or especially if you have someone you love by your side. It's not worth risking, especially if he's got a gun and he's got a friend. Got a gun. Just give him what he wants and let him go because you can always make more money. It's not worth risking your life at all. So, you know, unless you know he's going to hurt you. If he shot your friend dead and said, give me your money, I'm going to kill you too, more than likely he's going to kill you afterwards. So that's the time I would assess the situation. I always tell my students, the first weapon you have is this. You have to assess the situation. You have to know what's around you. You have to know if you need to attack or you can run away. You know, fighting for your life is not worth the risk if you can get away. So just get away. It's the first thing you should do. Absolutely. Um, Russell says, will a Tai Chi seminar hours be applied to NODAC NA certification? Um, for NODAC NA Tai Chi, yes, it will. Yes, but not for the Tai Chi itself. It's different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to do two separate certifications because uh, Nodagna is encompasses a lot where the Tai Chi is just specifically chi, for yeah. the Tai Chi. So it's going to cater to two different people that are uh, wanting to, or sometimes for both. If you're interested in both, then obviously we'll work that Think out. Think of it like this, Nodagna, Tai Chi. And this is the Nodagna. It, it holds all of the digits. All the digits. And this is <laughs> that that helps make up the hand. So Dan says, uh, hi, Sifu, to go along with your point on attacking the point, not blocking and defending, could you explain how this would look in a chi style environment? Well, when you're rolling, do you know roll? Larry? Awesome. But he's he's better than me. I can roll with you if you want. But when, I'm just learning. When, when you're rolling, <laughs> we'll get it's, it's, we'll it's, get it's about putting now. pressure on the point. In other words, I look unconstipated. You're not rolling just like this. Like See how I look like? I'm just rolling. But he can attack me at any time because I don't have anything on him, right? So the idea is when you roll, first get your three-proof and hit the point. So when he, uh, you're here, he feels pressure on him now, right on the point, not against him. In other words, I'm not going against him. You don't see me going like this and trying to push the arms. I'm not doing that. I'm actually going to take this. I'm going to turn into the point every time. So when I hit, I'm going to hit just to the point. So in the roll, I can adapt to change. So when I'm like this, attack me whenever you want. I can attack. And see, now my forward energy is on him. I'm, I'm more into him. So everything you do is about having the hands ready to snap. So if he's going off point, my hands just hit right away. If he's doing anything where he's, he's moving his hands anywhere, I can now just... Attack. I, I should have the initiative to always feel like I can attack. Not necessarily that you will, but you should have the potential to attack. So should he make a mistake, it's going to his face. It's going to his body. But if you're not having the initial attack, then you're always going to feel like you're, you're receiving energy. The goal is to receive and give at the same time. So when I feel his energy come to me, I'm going to take the energy, like push into me. I can take that and I'm going to turn it back. So I'm always going to have that attacking, counterattacking mode. So however he does anything to me, I'm always in this attacking mode. So I'm always on him. And see, I'm always on. So when I'm like this, I see my default hands. See when he moves. See, I'm here. See, I, I went to default hands. He broke the default hands. See, no <laughs> default hands. If he went like this and made the default hands, he could turn that into my wrist. And then I notice how I counted by a default hand. So it's always about learning how to get to the point yeah. and turning the wrist and using the base of the arm. You know, you have to have the base. You have to have the three proof. You have to the shoulder, the elbow. If without that, then the hand's no good. Without having the other two proof, the shoulder, the elbow, elbow, the wrist, then the wrist will fail. Okay. Once you have the first two, you need to make the third one work because that's going to decide whether you're on or off point. Yeah. Because a lot of people, I watch them play chi sour. When I play chi sour with somebody, they put energy on the arms. But there's no forward pressure, so it's right. like I'm playing patty cakes. Like, like there's no attack, there's no defense. Your hands, when you're playing, you should feel like this. You see how every time I'm on him, you can see my hands. I'll go like this, and they put the pressure. And look how I'm putting pressure. I'm putting. You right can on see point. it. Look, you can see it ride back into me. So now, when he does that, he's going to take that energy. He's going to put it up to his wrist, and that's now. We, so now we play to. <laughs> you're gonna kill me. So you can see, you can, you have to play to point. It feels very different when you start rolling because now you feel like this pressure on. Or the guy's gonna feel like, wow, I feel him on Take me. Him Whereas before, it's like I feel him just touching me. Then when you do point control, then you feel him into you. 
get my draft good all right so uh we're about to wrap up um but i did see email from one of our family members liam um, Pastor Liam said that he would like all of us to say a prayer, not just for him, but everyone uh, that's dealing with Harvey, as well as uh, those that have already been hit by Irma and those that are probably sadly going to be hit uh, very soon by Irma. And also we have another hurricane, Jose, and I think there's one other one. So uh, for those of you that do pray, please say a prayer. I know my daughter and I have been praying without ceasing quite frequently uh, for everyone. We have a lot of loved ones down in Florida. Um, Hector, who you see on a lot of the videos, thankfully his family is okay. Most of them are in Puerto Rico um, and they you know, still got a lot of bad weather and he's not really sure about all the damage, but everyone is okay and safe. So for those that are praying, please keep everyone in your prayers and not just for these storms, um, also for the all the political craziness that's been going on, the wars, there's just so many things going around the world. Just Take the time if you do pray to just pray for everyone because everyone could use some extra prayers. So thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. And uh, we won't see you next week because we are going to be at our event, but we will start these back up the next week after that. Well, maybe just an idea. I don't know if it's possible. Okay. If we have internet, maybe we can just put a live for a half an hour or so and they can see the seminar. Well, it'll be a different time. Yeah, and, and we later. can just send them. We, we are trying to figure out, I will I will say this, we are trying to figure out how we can actually live stream the whole seminar for those that are interested. I'm not making any promises that we're going to actually get to do this, but we are going to be playing around with some stuff this weekend with our cameras because they have that capability. Um, we're waiting to get uh, the connector that we need and we're going to figure out how to do it because we've never done it. So it's like, like need Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, well, we have yeah, Wi-Fi here to practice. Um, and I know I can get the Wi-Fi connection for live streaming with a hotel. I got to pay extra fee for it. Um, but if we can figure out how to get, make it work, then we are going to make it happen. So I will keep you all posted through email about that. And thank you again for joining us. If you have any questions. One more question. Yeah. Man. Oh, we got one more that came through. Okay. Eddie says, Tifu, do you teach how not to accidentally kill someone in a fight from an attacker or attackers is it fear of mine it's a fear of mine is it a fear yeah oh it's, it's a, a fear, fear it's mine. a fear of that's mine. not questions that's sorry fear. yeah <laughs> um understand there's two things it, it's it, it it can be hard to kill a guy and can be very easy to kill a guy um again you when you kill a guy with like one hit you know what you're doing or it's by chance you got lucky I mean, but it's a very rare chance that you get lucky. Most of the time, like you see when people get hit, they live. I've seen people get mauled by animals and they live. People get shot and they live. So it's it's not so easy like one hit, you're going to kill a guy unless you're that good. You know what I mean? Like you're that lucky. If you're that lucky, we got to go to the casinos, okay? Um, but honestly, it's not as easy to kill a person as you think it is. Hit in the face, hit across the body. There's a few reasons. One, you know, the body's pretty resilient. It's pretty tough. It can, it can recover from a lot. But two, you got to understand when a person's hit, a lot of times, unless they throw a lot of committed energy and you can hit them during that committed energy, um, the body will yield to the pressure. You know, you hit them across the jaw, their head will move, the body will move. So, and, and then they might just move just as a, an instinct to move, but they still get hit, but it's it's not going to be as devastating as you think. Unless you're doing, like I said, pressure point striking, uh, uh, cavity striking, where you purposely aim, you know, hitting up the nose, that can kill a guy. But that's that's intentional. If I crack the guy as hard as I can across the nose, like that, I can hit him as hard as I can. Hurt like dirt, but it will not kill him. There needs to be a specific way to drive that nose to break the cartilage and drive out the brain. That's intentional. That's not an accident. It's just like probably one in a million is if it's an accident. You know, you're hitting a guy like this and you have to bring his nose down. That would be like one in a million type of thing. It's, it's usually intentional. So don't worry about it. And just remember this. If you're fighting for your life, you know, and again, you have to assess the situation. They got knives. They threaten to kill you, you know, your family, whatever. I don't know the situation, you know, but you have to assess that situation. And then don't worry about it. You know that saying, better to be judged by 12 than to be carried by six. If your life's at stake, don't worry about the consequence at that moment. You know, more than anybody would understand. This guy's got a knife. He tried to kill you. Who's going to really try you? You know, unless you took the knife, he's like, please no more. And then you stabbed him. But in the middle of that, if you killed him in the middle of that, it, it was your life or his. Obviously, you know, the Chinese have a saying to show mercy on your opponent is to have pity upon yourself. And what that means is if someone's trying to kill you and you're trying not to hurt them, I feel bad for you because you're probably gonna wind up dying. Yeah, that's true. Okay, remember, assess the situation, see if it's worth risking your life. You know, if you can run away, great. If you can't, but if, if you have to kill them to stop them, otherwise they're gonna hurt you badly, then do what you gotta do. I don't promote killing. Uh, life is 
very precious in all t- forms. Um, but you know, if someone's trying to do you harm, your family harm, you got to do what it takes to protect them. We're allowed to do that. It's a, it is our right, you know, by law and God's right, you know. It's better to take out the garbage and take out something good. You know, a friend, yeah. one of my students was a pastor. And this, I'll make this quick. But we were talking and he, I said, you want to do this to make sure that they you'd incapacitate them, you know, striking across the ear, pressure points. And he, and he said, would that kill them? I said, it could if you hit them right, in the right spot real hard. He goes, well, I don't want to do that. I would never want to learn to kill someone. I was like, let me ask you something. If, a mur- if, if somebody was a murderer and he was in there to kill your family and, and try to kill your wife and your kids, and you had a gun in your hand and you could shoot him and kill him, would you do it? And he said, no. I said, why? And he goes, because more likely if he's like that type of person, he's not saved, then I'd be condemned to hell. Uh, and so I'd rather him kill my family and myself and all we'll go to heaven. And so he won't go to hell. I said, but he that's, still go to hell. That's, I said, right? I told him, I said, that's a selfish reason. Uh, and I go, I mean, he goes, what do you mean? And I said, listen, what if that thought was there? And let's say you could have stopped him, but you didn't. And this guy winds up killing 10 more people who were not Christians because you decided that you could go to heaven and it's okay and then not send him to hell because he was doing wrong. But yet this guy came out and he murdered 10 other people who weren't saved. And he goes, you know what? I never thought of it like that. Yeah, you have to understand. Yeah, salvation is very important and and you don't want everyone sending anyone to hell. But the guy made his choice, you know? And if he was willing to kill people and didn't care, obviously, unless... A miracle happens sometime in the future, which at that moment, you have the right to protect your family. And again, you don't know yeah. what the future is, but you know what the present is. Assess the situation. Weigh it out. If you're the kind of guy who says, I'll let him kill my wife and kids, and you can live with that, and let's say you wind up living, if you can live with that, that's on you. But I wouldn't. I'm not going to let anyone hurt my family as long as I, I am able to protect them. I would never. Even if they could go to heaven, I'm still not going to let them hurt them. Because if they lived and they didn't die, the guy was living... It, it, it's, it's emotional trauma for, for them to go have to go through that. And I, if I can prevent that as my, as a father, as a husband, it's my job to protect my children. And I would do it and I would kill someone without hesitation if they try to hurt them. Yeah. And I also say that if you are really like worried about that scenario, what you worry about the most you're going to bring into you. And it's anything, if you think about something enough, you're going to bring that scenario. Um, like people that are like, paranoid about getting a car because they're worried about getting a car accident. If they think about that enough, they're going to attract that situation into their life. That's just the universal law that God has created. So I would say, don't worry about it. Train proper, train right. You're going to know what you need to do when you need to do it. And just, you know, don't worry about it in the meantime. As Sifu says, if you think, you stink. So don't overthink it. Paralysis from analysis. Absolutely. (laughs) So thank you, family. Uh, We really enjoyed having y'all on here. Let's see. We had a couple of people that raised their hand, but I'm not sure why. Um, If you guys need anything, email us at support at nrshallon.com in case I missed something in the chat and I didn't see it. Uh, I apologize if I did. Um, And if you guys have any other questions that you want to have for the next webinar, that'll be in two weeks. Email us at support at nrshallon.com. If you're not part of our family yet, come check it out, nrshallon.com forward slash join. And if you are or you're not, but you want to support us in a different way, we do have a Patreon where you can be a Patreon, get some exclusive content that you won't find on nrshallon.com or YouTube. And that's at patreon.com forward slash nrshallon. So we'll see some of you next week live and interactive. And for those of you that are members, don't worry, even if we can't live stream it, you will get all of the video. So that'll be another bonus for members out there. So even though you can't be here with us, it's okay. You're still going to get the awesome training. So we'll see you all next two weeks, two weeks from now and some of you next week. All right. Bye everyone. Bye.